I have been an admirer these many years of Mr. Joe Grimaldi. And you have been his stage partner for 30 years, I believe, Mr. Bologna. And his brother-in-law. But he's hit such hard times now. I shall open by recounting the Times opinion. Grimaldi reinvented pantomime with his mother goose of 1806 in Drury Lane. I shall say that during Grimaldi's time, many have risen to fame. The poets Byron and Wordsworth, the writers Jane Austen and Mary Shelley, Napoleon, Nelson and Wellington have fought their battles, and the Prince Regent took the throne of Mad King George. Grimaldi is as famous as any. I am pained by his retirement and his infirmity. Not as much as he is. You've got gout, gravel, gastric spasms, rickets, rheumatism, osteoporosis, arthritis, atrophy, palsy, quinsy, dropsy, fractures and pelvic degeneration. At least you're not deaf. <laughs> Pardon? Your biggest problem is melancholy and depression. What is the cure for my husband, Doctor? Laughter is the best medicine. I prescribe a trip to the theatre. Aye, go see Grimaldi. Funniest man alive. That'll cheer you up. I think not. And why not? I am Grimaldi. Paying him more, Mr. Dibdin. All that scenery costs a pretty penny. You may concoct the special effects, but it's my Joe that puts bums on seats. It's the highest paid clown in Europe. Sadler's Wells have offered us more for next year. Well, why don't you work both theatres at the same time, Mrs. Grimaldi? That'll keep you in your finery. Who'd have thought? Father and son performing for the Prince Regent. Oh, be quick, Father. The carriage is waiting. He's a good lad. You know, Jack, the audience love to join in. Whenever I take the banana, I always ask, shall I? Shall I? Ah, it's good. I like that. It's nearly nine. We've got to be at Drury Lane for nine o'clock. You're famous. They've even named the clown puppet after you in the Punch and Judy. They must have seen the way my dad used to beat me with a stick as a child. My royal command. Your father would have been so proud of you. My father? Proud of me? Oh. Don't forget the planks on. <laughs> He's a good lad. Now take your medicine. Oh dear, oh dear. Good. Now, Lord Byron is here to visit. And Mr. Dibdin has come round to make you a splint for the ease of walking. Oh, help me through to the parlour. Lord Byron, kind of you to call. I was just telling his lordship you've been feeling a bit down. Depression is the mark of a true artiste. Tennyson Wordsworth and I often say, the line between genius and madness is 
but a wafer. You are one of us. You hear that, Dibdin? I'm one of them. How's my boy doing? Not a bad standing. You taught him well. He's a good lad, Byron. Earns five pounds a week on tour, sends a pound home in the post. The trouble is, we sent him two pounds back in change. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the coffin that will carry me off, it's the coffin they'll carry me off in. J.S. Uncle Jack. Not as much as your father, but then you're not the draw you was, are you? So I'm not as good as my sickly father. Well, that makes you know better than my spendthrift mother. Well, she squandered the Grimaldi fortune on fine houses and a finer education for thee. J.S. me old mucker. You'd have made your pappy proud tonight. Here comes trouble. Henry's my friend, Uncle Jack. And he's the best harlequin in London. His nail ass, well recommended in town. J.S., don't let him lead you astray, mate. Just one. To wet the whistle. After the exertion of three shows today, of course. I'm ready for a fourth. Look, whilst my father's ill in bed, I'm the new star of the show. But your father asked me to look after you. Well, Mr. Bologna can chaperone us. I was a good little girl till I found you. Off to the ale ass, then. JS? Yeah. You set my head in a whirl, my poor heart, too. <laughs> Old Uncle Jack, Mr. Goodnight. But he's the same as your father. So busy making audiences laugh that they never find time to laugh themselves. Don't let life pass you by, J.S. Now will never come again. Why don't you get another drink, eh? policeman with three heads. <laughs> <laughs> now then, young Grimaldi, your father avoided censorship of the Lord Chancellor by not speaking in his pantomimes. I counsel you the same to avoid arrest. <laughs> So your father performed that once. You're nearly as good as he. Nearly as good. And that, sir, is a compliment. Son. He's in better shape than you, husband. Oh, boy. Arrested for a fray. 
Have you no regard for the family name? He's a good lad, Mother. Some people can't take a joke, Pappy. He spends all his money on wine, women and song. It's true. I'll waste the rest. I shall see to the floozy you brought home with you, then. So how are your legs, Pappy? Pa, what do doctors know? I suffered worse at my father's hands. I remember one time, when I was six years old, he told me to go and wait at the stage door. I never disobeyed for fear of a beating. Then these toffs offered me two half-crowns to do me eccentric dance. Father arrives, sees me jigging and knocks seven bells out of me. He fractured two ribs and left me dizzy for a week. The toffs thought it was really funny, but when they'd gone, he really hurt me. He took the two half crowns off you. He took the two half crowns off me. I never wanted you to suffer the way I did, son. Is he fit enough for this comeback? In my professional opinion, no. If it was a horse, I'd shoot him. I'm dandy. King of pantomime for 20 years. I'm not going to let some counterfeits take my throne. Depression lifted, then? You know me. Grim all day, funny at night. You've got 14 broken bones. You've had two coach crashes. Shot yourself in the foot. Suffered depression from failed business enterprises. And finally, you've got seizure of your leg muscles. Apart from that, though, he's fine, eh? <laughs> Listen, your lad stood in well for you last night, but you know his problem's off stage. He's a good lad. Give him another chance. He's every bit as good as me and half the price. Half the price and twice the trouble. You're smitten lame from professional tomfoolery. But it was the blow to the head from the truncheon that brought on the son's epilepsy. Good day, gentlemen. Stop it! Stop! Here we go again! Come on, Doctor, get him strapped. Uh, hands in there, Doctor. Your father said I had to restrain you after every performance tonight. It's oh. all right, lad. It's for your own. Oh, God. yeah, you're all Don't right. Don't you worry, lad. It's for your own. Step back! Right. 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 Say good night, sunshine. <laughs> what lunacy is this? <laughs> I leave him subdued like that for days in between shows. I say it's for his own. I wonder who's more mad, the son or the father? You painted this from my box of tricks when you were just seven. I'll be working again soon, as soon as these old legs mend. It was the Greeks who invented the masks, so the audience could see the expressions from a distance. And who invented the clown face makeup? That would be you, Pappy. Did I ever tell you why I've made the mouth so wide? To show the innocent smile of a child, and the impish grin of a devil. And the baggy costume gave me the freedom to be the fool. The baggy costume? Mm hmm That's my real straight jacket. Here we are, here we are, here we are again. You look like a fiendish madman, Pappy. I'm not the one in the straitjacket, son. Help an old soldier to the pole, son. I gave you everything I never had as a child. Loving family, good education. The truth is, son, I'll never perform again. I've nothing saved. The truth is, you're breaking my heart and my reputation. The truth. The truth. 
The truth is, is that you have cursed me with your madness and your melancholy. Nobody hears my voice. Nobody, nobody hears my voice. They just hear the echo of yours. I'll tell you what you taught me, Pappy. When you're at the top, there's only one way to go. I'll race you to the bottom. You're a good lad, son. Give your old man a shave. And what of his son? A lunatic, I believe. Hasn't seen his loving father for three years. Broke poor Joe's heart. My lords, ladies, and gentlemen. Joe Grimaldi! <laughs> those who never saw him, description is fruitless. To those who did, no praise comes up to their appreciation of him. We therefore shake our heads and say, oh, you should have seen Grimaldi. stand worse on my legs than I did on my head. Tonight, I assume the motley for a short time. It clings mournfully to my skin as I quit the stage for the last time. Mary? Mary, where's our boy? When's he coming? His last letter read, Dear Pappy, at present I am in difficulties, but as long as I have a shilling, you shall have half. He's a good lad. JS told me he was too ashamed to come home and face his parents. Oh, I... I well, a while after you last saw him, he was fit enough again to work his father's routines. Unfortunately, he died in shabby circumstance. In this very public house. Aye. I was stood right beside him as he took a fit on the floor. I wouldn't have minded, but uh, it was his round. Mary died soon after, they say, of a broken heart. Grimaldi's broken body no longer permitted him to walk. Old friends carried him. His last days spent in poverty, 
crying out for a cloud to lift his spirits. He made the masses laugh, but died alone. One last tumble, and the curtain fell on the funniest man in the world.